So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first episode of Q&A with uh, Kalor and Akko Pian. And of course, I'm here with uh, Dr. Akko Pian and myself. Um, welcome back. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. And uh, today we're going to discuss the, the importance of anatomy in, in uh, specifically in TCM study. And uh, of course, predominantly for acupuncture. Anatomy is the, the study of the body. So the actual term derives from the Greek verb, and correct me if I'm wrong, anatomine, which means to cut open or dissect, right? It describes the, uh, the most important process of this field. Mm -hmm. So the opening and dissecting. And it's probably the oldest scientific discipline of medicine. First documented, I believe, in the, the third century BC. Yeah, 300 BC. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, you have Claudius Galen, who also did some in, in, in Greece, who did... Uh, mostly an, uh, mostly animals. animal studies. Yeah, yeah, mostly animal studies. Yeah. And um, of course, there were, there were a lot of corrections later by his peers. Anatomy has been through a rough history because... Um, Persecution. The, Persecution, yeah, and, and and during the Renaissance, people started to appreciate it more, like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. I've even read that, um, was it Leonardo or was it Michelangelo? I think it was da Vinci. It was went, da Vinci, uh, yeah. Basically, grave robbing. Grave robbing, yeah. that's what he did. <laughs> Yeah. He had in some order. he had some friends in low places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, but also also high places because he also yeah. had a, a medical uh, friend yes. friends who were um, in medical school and then um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um yeah. the the thing is with uh, anatomy is that there's this preconception of the uh, a myth or misconception I mean of dissection in ancient China. Let's start with that. Yeah, I, I think I think there, it's not it's not even a misconception. There is factual evidence that it was frowned upon, because the the classic Confucianist the, uh, theorem, uh, which valued uh, family and respect for the elderly and respect for your ancestors, almost to a worship state, right. uh, precluded anyone from desecrating the uh, the bodies of uh, uh, of their ancestors or anyone. Any it was considered a sacred uh, uh, vessel. Uh, however, there, is, there are historical precedences where criminals were, uh, as part of the torture or uh, punishment mechanisms, uh, were sub subjugated to, uh, to dissections. And I will discuss a little bit in a little bit later uh, about a one particular text, medical text that has been uncovered that actually, um, interestingly enough, survived uh, what occurred with the Western uh, uh, procession of anatomical studies. But a little bit about anatomy in general. You, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, the subject of anatomy is now an entire scientific discipline. And there are different degrees of anatomy. There is the gross anatomy, which basically deals with the dissection of muscular stru structures and tissue structures and analysis of uh, attachment points of muscles and vessels and nerves, et cetera, et cetera, the structural component of anatomy. And then there is the cellular anatomy, which is uh, dealing with the actual cell, the uh, uh, tissue, the, um, the functions of various components within the cell. So there's a, a more of a, um, a focus on functional anatomy in uh, to that context. And then there is also the whole progression of uh, imaging techn technologies that are used to uh, study and understand anatomy, where they can do additional studies uh, utilizing uh, newer methods uh, for, for studying of the human body. The most important aspect of anatomy in general is uh, it, it, it allows uh, the scientific community to get a better understanding of the mechanical structure that underlies the living organism that we're studying. Uh, the role it plays for our profession is, I believe, underestimated. In many of the TCM schools, there is very little exposure to the required anatomy. Yeah. That is essential. Yet we're we're expected to insert needles into that same tissue, mm -hmm. 
if you go to an MD before they can even do any phlebotomy, uh, drawing blood, etc., they must have full knowledge of the tissue that they're puncturing, the depth to which that they can go, and all the underlying structures. Uh, yet you look at uh, an average uh, point location description, uh, it uses superficial anatomical landmarks to locate a certain point. Uh, and here's the depth uh, uh, in terms of tune measurements. And uh, here's the angle that you can go to, 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 to a certain degree. So I think for us to really get a better handle of, of what we're doing with that needle, where is it going? What is it? What tissues it's penetrating uh, uh, to the degree where we can now understand uh, in hindsight, literally, uh, as a subconscious way to understand as I'm inserting a needle, what am I going through at this point? What tissue did I just puncture? Where did I go? Where have I reached? At what depth can I stop? And more importantly, where is it that I obtained the dirt chi? Mm -hmm. Because that's the essential component of acupuncture. Sticking needles is one part of it. The obtaining, maintaining, sustaining the dirt chi allows you to then affect uh, um, therapeutic change at that acupuncture point. All of these uh, um, classic descriptions of the techniques used are relying on understanding of what we're doing with that needle at that acupuncture point. So mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, what, what, what's what been happening in China, uh, it's interesting. Now, anatomy from, from the Western allopathic uh, perspective, uh, the first studies and, and uh, anatomical studies were conducted 300 BC. Uh, by uh, Herophilus and Erasistratus. Um, unfortunately, many of their writings and then subsequent research in, in anatomical studies were part of the Alexandra, uh, Alexandria Library, which got burned down. So mm -hmm. most of that, most of those records disappeared. And uh, it, it took almost a thousand years for it to get a, a, a renaissance, if you will, a renewal after, you know, mm -hmm. at the dark ages. And uh, the biggest contributor was Andreas Vas uh, uh, Vesalius with the 1543, seven volumes, if you will, of the Humani Corporis Fabrica Libri Septum, which is a document, uh, a seven volume anatomical study guide. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, um, a look at that material, it, said, it then served as the basis for many of the, of the anatomical studies that followed subsequently. Um, a lot of the uh, ancient Greeks, Galen included, uh, even in the Arabian nations, uh, Ibn Sina uh, and his followers conducted uh, cadaver studies and dissection studies, but very little of that information has really uh, um, disseminated as a classic text. Going to China, having stated the fact that um, classically um, dissection was frowned upon as uh, desecrating the body, which is a sacred vessel. However, uh, re, uh, you know, a discovery of an, uh, the Mawangdui medical text, uh, that's what it's called, Mawangdui, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, mm. um, in, in a uh, tomb, has shed some interesting lights. There is actually some very uh, um, recent research on the ma manuscripts on those texts and yeah. how they reveal uh, and describe the anatomical structures as they uh, pertain to describing, particularly to, to describing the uh, meridian vessels to the, uh, which ultimately ended up serving as the basis during Huang Di uh, era to form the, um, the, the basis for the meridian points and acupuncture points. Yeah, yeah, I read about that te uh, text and also because in, in, in wartime or persecuted criminals, they, they were dissected in China. They were even ordered to... to Undergo a punishment. Yeah, it was part of the punishment techniques, yeah. Yeah, but also the, the, uh, the coroner was ordered to weigh the, the organs and make note and measurements. Yeah. So um, there, there were records of this. Yeah. And um, I, I think the, the, um, the problem was also that, you know, uh, the missionaries that were in contact with China at that time, they ran into the Chinese way of, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> like the, a wall. <laughs> yeah. 
however, even with all of that, I think there's sufficient evidence now uh, and surfacing evidence. And, and I can share the uh, uh, DOI number for that research article that actually mm -hmm. highlights and really describes each of the Meridian network described in the Mwangui texts and how they correlate to a vascular structure and to the anatomical uh, indices and structures in the human body. So I can, I can, we can make that available for our viewers if they want to do their own conduct their own research and, and look into it uh, in their own time. The significance of all of that is not just forming the basis for the meridian networks, but also the acupuncture points, because the Mwangdui text does not have points on it. It is a vessel. It describes the vessel, the pathway of, uh, and interestingly enough, they actually don't attribute those vessels to organs. The Mwangdui text does not uh, mention it as here's the stomach channel and or here's the uh, kidney vessel, etc. They talk about the six meridians or the the uh, uh, the specific associations with the um, the Shanghan uh, precept, the the stages, if you will. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, they will talk about the Shaoyu and the Greater Yang, the the bright Yang meridian or the uh, the, the paired meridians. And then subsequently, it was in during Huangdi that acupuncture points were developed and identified on those meridian networks. Because this original text is from what period? This predates this predates uh, uh, the uh, Western discoveries, Western anatomical studies. Yeah. You know, from a significance perspective, uh, you know, I get a lot of questions. Well, you know, uh, and dissections. You know, uh, I'm not comfortable, etc. One of the testing uh, uh, baptisms by fire for uh, medical professionals is actually taking them to their first cadaver studies because you're either going to make it or you're going to break it you know yeah, yeah, yeah. because and, you were you you set up a cadaver studies at the uh, university right in Armenia. yes yes at the medical university in armenia we actually uh, were at a position where it allowed us and you know a lot of countries uh, uh, share uh, the uh, hesitation with china greece is uh, very much like it they're very uh, uh, anti uh, uh, allowing random ad hoc cadaver studies. Only major universities and medical facilities have the access and the rights uh, to perform those types of things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we finally were able to set up a, a study center, a cadaver laboratory, where we were doing dissections, primarily organs and uh, in, internal structures, uh, um, conducting some hands on for the third and fourth year medical students. So, okay. Yeah, it, the difference it, um, compared to the 17th century where they had anatomical theaters and public, exactly uh, autopsy. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, uh, the human body has always been um, uh, taboo. You know, I can consider how these uh, uh, theaters, uh, in fact, I have a, a, an interesting photo right here of Vasilius performing a cadaver study in a public <laughs> uh, uh, theater type setting. And yeah, I could see yeah. how that could be viewed as kind of macabre uh, in in today's standards, even. So, uh, so yeah, I could I could see how. However, in many of our clinical studies in medical universities, there are theaters, surgery theaters, where students can sit in the balconies, if you will, and observe a procedure being conducted. So yeah. it, it's nothing uh, new, and it does serve a value. Uh, and I that believe led, led to uh, anatomical art as well in the 18th century, right? Like absolutely. They, they injected uh, them with color, colored wax, and uh, yes, and, uh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, you know, uh, in a lot of the uh, uh, structured and anatomical models, uh, the plastic models, etc., that you look at, veins are always blue and arteries are always red. In real cadaver, it's not. You do not you do not get a nice clear blue for the vein, a nice yellow for the nerve. You know they're all bland colors that that you need to uh, sort things out. Yeah, they're so, pretty bland. Yeah. So the significance of these uh, of these anatomical studies, especially for our profession, is it allows the practitioner to feel more confident. It a the most important. It allows you to know exactly where the point is in terms of finding the anatomical landmarks, locating them, 
you know, and then being able to palpate that point, do your diagnosis, and then know exactly where you're inserting the needle, how deep you're inserting, and what structures you're penetrating as you go through it. Yeah. You're not going there blind. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I've been now teaching anatomy for both medical students and uh, allied health students, which includes phys physiotherapists, chiropractors, and uh, even acupuncturists. And I find that many of them uh, lack the fundamental knowledge of even, even topographic anatomy, yeah. even being able to identify key anatomical landmarks. Yeah, another reason why to emphasize well more anatomy in in, in uh, for example education for physical therapists or acupuncturists. You know, initiating a whole cadaver study might be uh, difficult for some countries to to regulate, but um, on these levels. But still, um, then at least more emphasis on the theoretical side of ana uh, anatomy. Think about where we are today. Technology has gotten us to a point where I can right. conduct virtual surgery. Right. If I can conduct virtual surgery, I can conduct virtual dissections. I can have video sessions of dissections, guided sessions with annotations. And I have compiled a, a, a long list of uh, online resources for our viewers that, that they can partake, they can go view these sites. There are many, many tools that allow you to create your own dissections. And with these resources, if, if we can integrate that with good theoretical fund foundational teachings of anatomy, which I believe should be one of the first courses that every student in, uh, um, our, in, in TCM profession must undergo. Right. And, uh, you know, because it gives them the foundational confidence to understand the human body, to be able to palpate the human body, to, to locate things on the human body with confidence. Mm -hmm. Then you can go and talk about meridians. You know, we jump in and we start teaching about the, the point locations and meridians congruently as we're trying to teach them in the human body. And it confuses, it loses the meaning, it loses significance. So I believe foundational science classes should constitute a core component of first year of education in, in TCM schools. Then you can talk about, okay, now you understand what the body is, where all the tissues are, where is the fascia and how the fascia is structured. Now, guess what? The fascia is part of Sanjiao, part of the triple burner. Now it starts making more sense than just uh, uh, theoretically describing a, a, an organ function of the triple burner to someone who has no conceptual visual uh, uh, understanding of what a peritoneum looks like. Okay, so let's say now you have the uh, you have the anatomy down first year anatomy 101 and then you get um, to the um, uh, uh, meridian system. How do you superimpose this on this anatomy you, mm -hmm. you just learned? The thing is, there's also been this idea about intangible meridian system. I believe in 62, there was a, a North Korean professor who started doing research on uh, providing scientific evidence of an animal, uh, anatomical structures that correspond to meridians. Yeah, um, yeah. Dr. Kim Bong Han um, was a, a surgeon, a medical surgeon in North Korea at the uh, university there. And uh, he actually came up with this whole concept of, um, of cellular structures that are part of the, uh, what he called the Kyung Rock system mm -hmm. of, uh, of circulatory system. Um, you know, the, it, it, the, the initial research uh, looked promising. And uh, I've done some work. I'm not by any means an expert at this. So, so uh, take my word uh, with a grain of uh, salt and, uh, and conduct your own research uh, and do your own studies. But the initial assessment, and again, at the end of the uh, session today, um, the, the TCM community will provide you with certain links and, and resources that will allow you to conduct your own search. And, and studies in this field. But the initial studies were promising because he was literally identifying tissue structures and, and um, vascular circulation, et cetera, that, that could lend with further studies uh, credence to the existence of the uh, meridian networks. Um, 
the history of that whole system is kind of murky, like many things coming out of North Korea. Yeah, but the problem is that they became, yeah, leave, the, yeah, leaving history aside. It's politics because at some point it became in political isolation. So the whole system was forgotten. But luckily in, um, uh, by the way, Kyongrak means meridian in Korean. Mm, and yeah. in, in 67, uh, the uh, Japanese anatomy professor Fujiwara was able to reproduce some of his results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it took him like half a year to reproduce just minimal yeah. results. Yeah. And then uh, it was picked up again in the 2000, the year 2000, by a, a, physicist, a physics professor in, in yes. Seoul. Yeah. in South Korea. And with the help of this uh, Japanese uh, professor Fujiwara, again, they were able to reproduce these results. And um, they, they confirmed that the, 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 the fluid circulated within the vessels uh, was abundant with immune cells and also contained certain embryonic cells, similar Structures, to stem yes. cells. Yeah. Yes, yes. But the thing is, they were all done on animal studies. So that's another thing to consider. Yeah. Yeah, but I think uh, um, one of the significant findings that that was made in that process was the association of the fluid circulation, the yeah. the water circulation, and and in that area, I've actually done some interesting uh, correlative analysis and research. And water is probably the quintessential Tai Chi. The Tai Chi too describes this this dipole nature that is present in the universe. And in life, the significance of water with its own dipole is so critical that at every turn, it it astonishes uh, uh, modern day scientists of the the weirdness of water, you know, because of that dipole nature, Mm -hmm. because of the hydrogen bonding, it allows the water to to act in in ways that, that can serve as a medium by which things can be transported. And so you may not ever find an actual physical structure like a vessel or a nerve fiber that acts as the meridian network. I can even hypothesize that. However, by understanding the ebb and flow of these water rivers, if you will, water pathways through the interstitial space, the triple burner, if you will, you can determine the pathways of a lot of these meridian networks and how energy, whatever the the essential catalytic components for the body's physiology to function are being transported back and forth. And it's all occurring in the interstitial spaces carried by water and the hydrogen bonding or the, the dipole nature of water. So, uh, you know, the resources available right now for for our community to enhance their knowledge and skills in these various methodologies, uh, you know, Meridian Research is probably one of the more comprehensive research components that that is still undergoing in our in our community and in by Western scientific community. So, So so there is research being done on meridian networks and i believe we may not even be in a position right now from imaging perspective from technologies that allows us to image the human body to even be able to see the meridian network however that doesn't mean that they're not there Mm. you know up until the turn of last century we weren't even aware of the lymphatic system you know it (laughs) took it took us that long to identify the lymphatic system as an actual circulatory system that is part of the overall uh uh uh, circulatory vascular system of the body so so i don't envision us not not being able to find it we will find it it's just a matter of finding the right uh visualization techniques um one of the interesting things that that plays a role in this is quantum physics they're very different than the laws that describe our Newtonian world. And they behave in weird ways too. There's whole concepts of quantum tunneling that people didn't understand and is still considered, even by Einstein, it was considered spooky action at a distance. You know, uh, he didn't want to believe in it. He didn't want to uh, uh, deal with it. But it plays a key role in many biological functions. It's possible that 
further research in in identifying or testing hypotheses in quantum mechanics or in 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 quantum physics theories can help us develop the techniques or the uh, mechanisms by which we can study the meridian network because we're dealing with energy vibration chi is is intent it's energy and uh, at the subatomic level even matter has been now classified as energy even electrons, all the fundamental components that make us who we are, from our neutrons to protons to atoms to electrons, they're all waves. They're all probability waves. There's no there's no actual physical. It's a vibration that vibrates at a certain state and becomes uh, an electron at this particular location that forms a molecule that does some biological functions for your body. So I think when we get closer to identifying and understanding a little bit more about the quantum components, we may come with techniques, we may be able to come up with techniques to identify the meridian network. Yeah, well, I mean, there is study been done also by a, a, a prominent acupuncture researcher and neuroscientist, Dr. Helen Langevin. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Yes, Langevin. Yeah, it's showing that um, the, the connective tissue, especially the hydrophilic and protoglycines, along with collagen fibers and fibroblasts, mm -hmm. winds around the end of an acupuncture needle. Mm -hmm. And when it's manipulated, rotated in the right place, it creates a, a, a detectable mechanical tissue effect, right? Yes. And yes. also, not locally, but also distally. Distally, correct. Yeah. This is one of the more significant points that I want to stress. And this goes back to tying into, uh, I'm a, I'm, if, if it's not apparent by now, uh, I'm a big advocate of triple burner. I believe <laughs> yeah. the triple burner has been undervalued and underrated in many, many classics, even modern uh, practices. But, you know, it, it's everywhere. All of the tissues that you just described, the collagen fibers, elastin fibers, yeah. interstitial tissue, the, the, all of that structure is part of the triple burner, the water metabolism system. And the interesting technique, you know, when you, when you twist the needle, when you, if you rotate it too fast, too hard mm -hmm. in one direction, why is it that it becomes difficult to extract that needle? It's because of the fibers that are wrapped around it that creates the resistance to extracting mm -hmm. that needle. So there is physical uh, uh, manifestation of the of the energy that you're inducing with that acupuncture needle, both locally and distally. Not to mention now uh, even uh, more research recently with regards to nitric oxide uh, at the local tissue of the insertion of the needle and how that has a distal effect on uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, down-regulating inflammatory processes by increasing the nitric oxide at that level. And also there is another study of myofacial network, right? My mm -hmm. official continuity network. So they really wanted to make clear that in the study, um, the myofacial meridian lines that they found were not acupuncture meridians, but lines of pull based on standard Western anatomy. Mm -hmm. And these lines transmit strain and rebound and uh, movement and providing stability th throughout the body's myofascia around the skeleton. Mm -hmm. But the thing is what they found is that these lines independently from uh, any um, Eastern uh, Meridian, networks, Meridian yeah. network, they had an 80% overlap with <laughs> acupuncture or the Thai uh, uh, Sipsen system. Yes. So, and, and there were key intersection points that, that were located at various acupuncture points, which play a key role in local tissue treatment. If you look at yeah. the description of that point from a TCM prescription perspective, a lot of the local prescriptions for that or local actions of that point are, are very specific to that myofascial uh, uh, point, yeah. the trigger point, if you will. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's great that they stated that, you know, the myofascial meridians evolved solely within the Western anatomical mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. And initially, they, they even deliberately omitted any comparison to yeah. acupuncture meridians. Yeah. But then at the end, 80% overlap. Yeah. Yeah. I think it might be a good idea also to um, share the, uh, the slide you were just showing me about the to have the viewers have a, a 3D idea of yes, yes, what absolutely. modern I think... technology can do. Yes, absolutely. I think, I mean, if you think about it, we have now 
every single sagittal, transverse, uh, uh, um, you know, axial line of human body scanned and, and recorded and downloaded and, you know, it's everywhere. And uh, you can integrate that into your studies of locating and understanding these points. For example, if I may uh, share yeah. this screen. So, you know, case in point, we're talking about uh, um, the acupuncture points. If many of the classic tests, many of the texts that we use to study acupuncture points right now have a, a, a relatively simple uh, illustration of where the point is located. This, this, for example, this image is from the Deadman book of acupuncture points. And you have a, an underlying skeletal system that shows uh, the primary bones and primary landmarks, if you will, and where the point is with a nice red dot. And then a um, quite descriptive and extensive uh, description in English or in, in verbal description of where the point is located. Uh, if you have very little anatomical study and you have no idea of the underlying muscles and tissues and structures, et cetera, and the bones, trying to learn the, the, the text-driven uh, description of a point becomes cumbersome. Now you got to memorize these things. And many students complain about point location being so difficult. And that stems from the fact that, A, they haven't built a really good understanding of the and underlying anatomical structures of the human body. And B, they, they can't visualize this. A text description is great, but it doesn't allow you to visualize. You have to engage both left and right hemispheres of the brain in order to really uh, um, commit a, a set of data to long-term memory. And by integrating visual components, it can help. There are many resources. Again, we will share these resources for you. But this is one particular resource, a resource that I use often when I teach. Is if you, for example, you know, you're looking at spleen six point right here, San Yin Jiao, and you want to know where it is in an anatomical environment. You can literally go into a online site right now that has the entire human body, sagittal and transverse slices of CT. You can locate the actual uh, slice right where the spleen six is located. And you can then view that slice specifically and get a really clear picture of where the various bones, here's tibia, fibula, there is the outlying muscles and, and the, the fascia. Here are the different muscle bodies in different compartments. And you can literally see where the, the spleen six needle point is and how deep you can go and what you're penetrating at that point. These types of studying, this type of mechanism of studying not only enhances the the knowledge but also gives you confidence as an as an acupuncturist to know how far you're inserting the needle what you're inserting into and where you're reaching the actual depth of the needle so this these types of tools should should be part of the standard education system for all acupuncturists. It's interesting that one of my teachers used to say in, in China, used to say, you can line up three TCM acupuncturists, you can ask them to needle spleen six, and they will all choose a different spleen six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that uh, underlying message is actually one of the reasons why we we, we can easily be relegated as uh, a, a pseudoscience by Western scientific community, because even when you were doing research, you know, if one practitioner does spleen six here and the next practitioner who's participating in the same clinical study needles it uh, half a tune up or half a tune <laughs> down, you've now altered the research. You have now yeah. changed the research. That's true. That's true. On so, the other hand, on the other hand, the reaction area is, it is an area. It's not just one specific point. I understand. However, if you don't even know the fundamental uh, uh, anatomical structures, the superficial topographic anatomy no, to locate, this is what yeah, I'm, yeah. you know, and, and unfortunately. And, and like you said, for scientific research, you should try to hit the bullseye every time and not even not even the point location, but also the exact depth 
Exactly. And, yeah. and you know, when I was designing research uh, uh, protocols, we would actually say all of the point locations were marked by one practitioner mm -hmm. and needling was done by one practitioner. You know, landmark, uh, landmark location topo topographic anatomy is, is a, a whole subject that I think every uh, uh, acupuncture student must attain. You know, for our viewers, I think my recommendation would be if you really want to know when you put that needle in, when you're pushing that needle in, if you really want to know where you're going, there are resources available for you. All is required from you is a little strong stomach. That's it. Because <laughs> you're going to be seeing potential human bodies being cut open and tissues being flayed out. And, and if you're okay with that, there are means for you to study the underlying structures. And, uh, you know, we will provide you with the links and you're more than welcome to research them out. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. You know, we'll be more than happy to take up another topic or dig deeper into that topic and, uh, and understand, uh, you know, study, uh, offer you more, more advice and uh, insight. Now, I think in conclusion, we can say that um, acupuncture meridians has been scientifically proven for 80% at least that um, intermuscular or intramuscular facial planes. They, they, they follow these planes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even individual points have been scientifically uh, confirmed. But the importance is anatomy study in uh, TCM education. Yeah, At significant. Early stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, if, 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 you, if there's one takeaway for all our viewers from this presentation going forward is know, know your body first, study the anatomy because that will give you so much more confidence in palpating these points, in identifying deficiencies or excesses at various meridian points or myofascial points or uh, subcutaneous tissue layers, et cetera. And then when you're ready to insert the needle and, and perform your therapies, it'll give you the confidence to insert the needle appropriately. A lot of my students, sometimes when they're in the beginning stages, they hesitate and that produces a painful treatment and the patient is uncomfortable. And it also adversely affects the, the student's ability to be in the right month mindset to obtain the duchy and perform the therapy. You have to have that, that, that confidence level to literally go in and put that needle in with, with clear knowledge of how deep you're going, where you're going, without fear, without hesitation. But that's the thing also, if you have a clear knowledge of where you're, what, what fibers you're gonna be hitting, then you have the confidence, you automatically have the confidence. Otherwise, exactly. it's just like sticking your hand in a, 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 black, a black box box, yeah. box, and then you don't know what's going to happen. But if you know the different layers you're going to hit, exactly. that gives you the confidence and also know exactly when to stop and reach the chi. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So I think um, let's conclude this uh, first episode of uh, okay. Q&A with uh, CNA. Okay. <laughs> I think it was a very... Uh, informative one you know yes. we have a lot of links that we're gonna put in the description if there's anything let us know and then uh, we'll get it back to you on that yeah and if there's a topic uh, our viewers are interested in maybe they can let us know and we can uh, uh, yeah. if there's enough interest in a certain topic we can uh, we can put a, a special session together yeah, to address right. some of those questions yeah just contact us at the, the tcm community or put a comment in the comment yeah. section below Bye. Great. So see you next time. See you next and, time. Uh, maybe we'll have a little part we, that we can do, um, pick some topics out of a hat or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or just some comments. I don't have a hat here. I do have a, like a, <laughs> I have a skull here. Maybe we can use that. <laughs> we'll pick some topics out of the skull. We'll do that. All right. Okay. 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 We'll, do a, we'll do a Bagua study. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks right. again and uh, see you next time. You have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>